Hi everyone, welcome to the Harvard Law Forum. I am Pete Davis, a 3L here at the law school and the chair of the Harvard Law Forum, longest running American Law School speaker series. A few thanks to begin ACS, the Environmental Law Society and the Food Law Society. This event is thanks to you. Thank you for help promoting it. In 1845, the writer William Cobbett said this of gardening, quote, no pursuit is so rational as this, as an amusement or relaxation, and none so innocent and so useful. It naturally leads to early rising, to sober contemplation, and is conducive to health. Every young person should be a gardener, if possible, whatever else may be his or her pursuits. Modern science has proven COVID right. Gardening reduces the risk of stroke, burns calories, and busts stress. Dirt has been known to be beneficial exposure to to it has correlated with lower incidence of asthma and allergies. Those who gardened regularly have shown roughly a 40% lower incidence of dementia. You don't need Rutgers scientists to prove this, but the result of gardening being surrounded by flowers and plants has been, uh, has been shown to be associated with, of course, long-term happiness. In this way, gardening is like the opposite of lawyering. Since it's, all, <laughs> since it's almost spring, I wanted to bring a master gardener to campus, and not just any master gardener. I wanted to bring one of the nation's leading advocates for community gardening, urban farming, food justice, and equal access to lo fresh, locally grown food. <laughs> Karen Washington has lived in the Bronx for over 25 years, has spent her day leaving New York City a much better place than she found it. She's turned empty lots into community gardens, helped launch City Farms Market to bring garden fresh vegetables to her neighbors. She founded Black Urban Growers to build networks of support for growers across the country and the coolest acronym, BUGS. And Ebony listed her in 2012 among the 100 most influential African Americans in the country. She is the co-creator of Rise and Root Farm, a cooperatively run farm in the black dirt region of Orange County, New York, to help us boost our moods, better our cities, and feed our neighbors. We welcome Karen Washington. <laughs> sending out an invitation, the reason why I'm here is because of the power of asking. So yes, my name is Karen Washington. I tell people I'm a farmer, I grow food, I feed people with body and mind. How many of you are growers? Good. How many of you are farmers? How many of you eat food? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I sort of start off with um, like, how do I get involved in, in, in farming? Um, right now, I'm 63 years of age. I'll be 64. Um, I grew up in the projects, Jacob Reese Houses in the Lower East Side. My family were, were farmers. My grandparents weren't farmers. So how did I become a farmer? Hmm. So it uh, all boils down to the fact that my mom was a good cook. Oh, she was a slamming good cook, three meals a day. But we never had a relationship to food. We never knew where the food came from, who grew it, never asked those questions. And so being a single parent in 1985, I moved to the Bronx, bought a new house, the American dream, and decided to have a big backyard. So there's three things I could do with it. I could cement it, where a lot of my um, neighbors did, put a lawn on it, or grow food. So I decided to grow food. Now, back in 1985, the internet was in infancy, so I had to go to the library. You remember that library? Yeah. I had to go to the library um, or bookstores and get those how-to books on, on, on growing vegetables. It also was speaking to a lot of my neighbors. So I decided I'm going to grow collard greens. I had to grow collard greens, part of my history, my culture. I had to grow collard greens. I grew um, peppers, eggplant, and the thing that I hated the most was a tomato, hit a tomato, came in the cellophane, green the cellophane, and, and it was pink. So I put my seeds in, put some water, some soil, and all of a sudden I just I saw this thing that was red. And I said, what is this object that's red and growing on a vine? Because my relationship to a tomato was, it was in a supermarket. So getting this red thing that I grew, that I picked, from this vine and ate it, and oh my goodness, the sunshine was just coming down my arm. The juices and never experienced anything like that before in my life. And as a result, wanted to grow everything. 
and from bananas, cutting the top off pineapples, putting seeds from avocados, you name it. But quickly soon I realized I couldn't do that. But I never lost that passion to want to grow. Fast forward, uh, subsequently what was happening in my neighborhood, because I, 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 I live in the Bronx, is it this? Let me, here. Okay, was this. So across the street where I live was an empty lot. And most empty lots are mostly low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. And back then, which I know now is really sort of structural racism, when you see empty lots, um, incinerators, uh, waterway stations, waste stations, mostly low-income neighborhoods. And this picture was in 1985. I lived right across the street. But if you look at this picture, this is what's happening here now in Baltimore, Detroit, and Philly. These areas still, still exist. And so my first inkling in terms of really, you know, thinking about growing food was to think about reclaiming land and reclaiming community. And so when we talk about this urban ag and urban food movement, it really didn't start off in terms of growing food. What it did was in terms of reclaiming communities. At that time, uh, crack cocaine was prevalent, uh, uh, prostitution, just people coming in the, in the night, just putting in garbage. And then you started to see people associate yourself as being garbage. And so people who had privilege left. They call it white flight. And those that could not had to stay. It was those individuals that got together to turn these empty lots into community gardens. So initially, it wasn't about food. It was about how we as a community can come together and turn something that was so devastating to something that was so positive. And so what a lot of people did was grow flowers and plants to make them beautiful. So that was the first instance when we talk about urban agriculture and community gardens and movement. And then came food. And so for me, initially it was growing food and understanding my relationship to food. But then I realized something else was more and more important, that I could no longer just look at food by itself that I realized that food had so many intersections. Food intersected health and education and housing and the environment and job creation. And I realized that I just couldn't just grow food and be satisfied because along the perimeter in my neighborhood, it was suffering from insufficient food, um, junk food, uh, processed food, all things that were detrimental. But yet when I would go to my friends who were in the more affluent neighborhood and look at the food that they were getting, it was mostly healthy food. And so all of a sudden, my, 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 my activism started to surface. And I started to ask questions about the food system. You know, people tell you that uh, it's about food security or food insecurity. So in... Uh, this is 1996, when the World Food Summit started to, to, to define what food uh, security and food insecurity was all about. And so I want you to take a moment just to read that sign, because in essence, it talks about you know, people, uh, insecurity, people not having, not having access to nutritious food, safe food, food that is healing. And so I would go through conferences, and I would you know, hear people talking about food in such a way that, you know, it, it should be sustainable, it should be secure, and then realizing that the food system is not broken. You know, you hear that you know, the food system is broken, it needs to be fixed for those of us who are trying to fix this food insecurity. But then I realized that, you know what? It's intended to do exactly what it is it, it, said to be. And that is to keep people down. That is based on race. It's based on economics. It's based on geography. 
that the reason why we have the problem that we have is this. And I talk about it all the time, living in a low-income neighborhood is based on hunger and poverty. Folks, we live here in these United States of America. So you tell me, why do we have over 40 million people in poverty? Between 12 and 14% of the population in poverty. I want you to just sit with that. And, and then ask ourselves why with a country that has so much resources, so much money that we have this. And so I question the system, and I question the people who have privilege. Because they're telling me that the food system needs to be broken. But yet I see what is happening along hunger and poverty. And so I ask myself time and time again, how does this happen? How do, how do people with such privilege allow this, this to happen? And so for me, it's about bringing down barriers, talking about food in such a way that gets people to think about the food system. You know, people ask me, so Karen, what do you think about you know, food justice and food sovereignty? And I know I can ask you in this audience, what is food justice? What is food sovereignty? Terms that you've heard time and time again. But for me, those terms are now becoming meaningless. And I say that because people will give you the cookie cutter definition of both. But they don't understand in reality that food justice and food sovereignty is an active transformational thing that has to happen. Another thing that people talk about is this. So I want you to say food justice for me. <laughs> you heard, have you heard the term food desert? And I tell people, don't say food desert, because it's an outsider term that is used to designate the food that I have in my community. I call it food apartheid, because it gets to the problem of the injustice of our food system. Food apartheid, not food desert. You're going to have to help me with this. Okay. Yes. How's it going? So in, my, so in my community, you know, when you talk about food justice, you're talking about the food system, you know, I tell people, we have food. What we don't have is healthy food choices. So I came up with my sort of pyramid of what the food system in my neighborhood looks like. First is the junk food. In my neighborhood, you have apple pies, blueberry pies, blueberry shortcakes, strawberry shortcakes, things that I'll give you a package you couldn't even pronounce the ingredients. We also have fast food on every block in my neighborhood. There's a McDonald's, there's a Wendy's, there's this thing called Kennedy Fried Chicken. I don't know where Kennedy Fried Chicken is, but in every neighborhood, in every corner, there's Kennedy Fried Chicken. And then the thing that was supposed to change the world is the fast food. I mean, sorry, it's the um, TV dinner. The TV dinner was supposed to be the new thing but yet, those are the three things that are in my neighborhood. The fast food, the junk food, the processed food. So when we talk about food justice, we need to talk about what it means, like I said, it's transformational, it's active, it's not passive. But in order to tackle food justice, 
you have to realize what is the injustice. Says. So, tell me, what do you think some of the injustices are? I want this to be interactive here. How many of you, how, wait a minute, how many of you practice food justice? Every hand should be, every hand should be up. Every hand should be up. Because if you live in a society that sees hunger and poverty, and you are supposed to be the next people that are supposed to inherit this place, and your hand is not up, because you don't know what justice is, then I gotta do a crash course. I gotta do a crash course because you have to know what the injustices are. Someone said economics. Yes, there's injustice in economics where 1% of the population is suffering, while 99% of the population is getting richer. The problem we have with land, the average age of a farmer now is 58 years of age. Who is going to be the next generation of farmers? Young farmers. But yet if they don't have access to land, You have no food. Land access. Land gives you power. Ownership of land gives you power. And a lot of people don't understand that. There are a lot of people who have families that have land in the South. Families that have land in the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and say they'll never go back. But they don't understand that once you break that tie, that lineage of you and your ancestors, you and your tradition, you and your culture, you lose power. And so now, land has become a premium. Even in my neighborhood, where we strive to hold on to community gardens, where farmers are trying to hold on to their land, land is being used as a force of discrimination. In my neighborhood, it's called gentrification, where people are being displaced. And people say, well, you know what? Gentrification is just something that just happens because it's people you know, that have money and they can afford to move in. But I said, gentrification has racial undertones. It's because it's not only people with money, but people with privilege or predominantly white that come into neighborhoods and displace people. Another injustice is the fact that our youth, most youth in low-income neighborhoods of people of color are now incarcerated. There are more men of color incarcerated than they were during the times of slavery. And so what impact does that have on communities, family members, when it comes to trying to get ahead? Again, the injustices that we see time and time again, which age discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, these are all injustices that y'all should be aware of. So when I talk about food justice, you need to raise your hand. When I talk about social justice, you need to raise your hand. Because you gotta understand that you just can't say the word, which so many of you do. You say the word, but you don't understand the meaning behind that word. It's easy to put it down in your paper. It's easy to, to put it down in your RFP. It's easy for students to come into my neighborhood and say, you know, can I videotape you? Can I interview you? Because I want to know what food justice and social justice is all about. But I tell them, you know what? Come out of my community and go back into your community, the community of privilege and affluence, and have them answer that question about food justice. No longer come into my neighborhood and answer that question. Go back to your neighborhood 
and ask those questions. How are they standing up for justice? How are people with privilege standing up for justice? <laughs> Economics. As a farmer, I live in a low-income neighborhood, and I try my best to balance the fact that in my neighborhood, in a lot of low-income neighborhood, are subsidy programs. Now, don't get me wrong, because you're taking me. Food pantries and soup kitchens, they're the best. But when someone tells me, you know what, you know what, I've been working at my food pantry or soup kitchens for 30 years, something's wrong with that. Something's wrong with that. Because those services were supposed to be for emergency purposes. And now what I see is that generation after generation are using it as a way of life. So as a farmer, when I have to go to my farmer's market, and I have to ask my customer to pay $2 for a bunch of carrots, they're going to tell me, I just got a whole bag of carrots free from the food pantry. Or, I just get 99 cents down at the local bodega. And so, again, about educating people to understand the cost and value of food, to say to that customer, well, I'm a farmer. I travel 50 miles to bring it down to you. Those, two, those uh, 50 cent a dollar carrots that you have at the bodega, you don't know who grew it, if they're sprayed with pesticides or insecticides, or how long they've been stored. And so, again, a food system that is based on subsidies they have now encroached on people's way of life. And so my response to that is to give people who have nothing, job creation, financial literacy, and economics. And I say that because people will come into my neighborhood when we talk about food. Let me get that clipboard and sign them up for another snap. You got snap? You need public assistance? But think about it. No one comes into my community to talk about financial literacy, job creation, entrepreneurship. You know, I sent my proposal, my ideas out to Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett, Amazon, Google, to come into my neighborhood and set up shop. Teach the people who have for so long been deemed powerless and give them the tools, opportunity, capital, land, or business, and see how that would change the dynamics of the food system. Just think about it. Getting people who were once deemed poor and powerless, and giving them those, giving them those important things as, as opportunity and, and, and capital, and change their powerless to being powerful. Understanding historical content. Folks, this is February, it's Black History Month. For me, it's bringing home for so long the understanding around agriculture through the context of African Americans. And I say that as an African American female who at one time did not want to farm. Because I, I was told and I was taught that my relationship to food was all about slavery and bondage and sharecropping. And even for me, having this journey, I had to understand the trauma that I had in my relationship to food and farming. And it wasn't until I went out to California in 2008 and saw this vast amount of land that inside me 
had that trauma come to the surface that I did not belong. And it wasn't until I confronted that trauma and that fear by going out into the field and putting my hands in that soil, and I found that connection of belonging. That my ancestors, who were farmers, who had agriculture going through their veins and their DNA, made my connection. <clears throat> and again, it's not taught in our history books. It is not taught in the food movement. When you talk about the food movement today, people tell you Michael Pollan, Mark Bittman. They'll never tell you about George Washington Carver. <laughs> who, who knows about George Washington Carver? Every hand should be up. That was the father of agriculture here in the United States. But yet, that's not discussed. That's not discussed. Power. And this food movement is definite, definitely about power about power over those who are powerless. And I say that because power is a drug. You know, people who have power is a drug. And, and, and it's hard for them to give it up. It's hard for them to give up. that power, hard for them to give it up. And so I tell people who have privilege and resources when do you want to give up your power? And I say that to organizations and institutions that talk about food justice and talk about food sovereignty, but when you look throughout their institutions or you look throughout their organizations, who's at the top? It's not people of color. And so, when we talk about power, how do you relinquish that power? And it's about understanding, again, the social injustice, but also understanding you, as people, have that power. The power to stand up against injustice. It's not about sitting in a classroom, talking about food sovereignty, talking about food justice, talking about social justice, knowing that you're in a class of agriculture, that you're in a class studying justice, but yet your institution is not practicing that, or your organizations are not practicing that. And that's where they need to be called out. About understanding the power dynamics that we see. Because I tell people, you know what? If you're not going to give me your power, I'm going to take it. Food sovereignty. I want to hit on this because, again, Another word that is used in our language. How many people know what food sovereignty is? Oh, yeah, okay. So again, yes, it's about people's rights and government, but it's a term that was really used from Latin American country in regards to indigenous people with their response to land and governance. And it's totally different from food justice, even though the two are intertwined. Because food justice is mostly what we see here in North America and Canada in regards to racial injustice. But food sovereignty is much more. It's based on land. It's based on culture. It's based on that historical content of indigenous people fighting for survival, fighting to have ownership of their own land, their culture. You know, talk, people talk about culturally appropriated food, but that's for everyone. And so, again, the term of food justice 
and full sovereignty being co-opted, being mingled together when there is a definite difference. And again, both, as I said from the very beginning, both are active, transformative movements. And just to sit back and just recite the definition of what full justice and full sovereignty means nothing to me. It's about what are you doing in your communities, in your school, in your neighborhoods, in your family, to talk about the injustices that you see. So, bring it back to power. So again, this is my definition, this is how I see it. So when does the power dynamic show up in, in our community, in our, in our society? Well, just think about it. When we don't have it, there are people, a handful of people, folks, that are controlling our food system. A handful of people out of the 7.8 billion people on this planet, there are five to six companies, food companies, that control our food. Something is wrong with that. When you can't afford it, Poverty. Again, 40 million people in poverty. 40 million, 40% of the population. What is killing you? Diet related diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity in the 1960s, unheard of in children of today. Now, most children. Mostly in poor areas, urban and rural. You know, poverty is just not in an urban area. There's poverty in urban and rural poor areas. Children now have a type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. When you don't deserve it. Again, we've got to be very, very careful on how we define this food movement and how we use words. I was on a panel one time, and so, you know, the person next to me was telling me how great it was for her to feed her family, going to Whole Foods, a whole paycheck, and able to buy that, you know, pristine uh, organic food, and feeding her family, and making herself feel good, and I just sat next to her and said, well, what does that make me? I don't have organics in my community. But yet, I'm able to feed my family healthy food, healthy vegetables and fruits. So again, we have to be very, very careful how we use language when talking about the food system. Because again, labeling, again, even the word organic is being co-opted by major companies. So we have to be very, very careful when we talk about this food system, when we talk about food and social justice, the language that we use. And again, when other, others control it, big ag. As I said before, six to seven companies control our food system. Something to think about. So what are people doing? So what are people doing in their own communities to counteract all the injustices that they that they see that they see? Many of them are reclaiming land, understanding the power of ownership of land and forming land trusts. And I tell people, I'm still waiting for my 40 acres in a mule. And I'm still going to fight for reparations to make sure I get my 40 acres in a mule, which I was promised, my family's promise. Growing food that's culturally appropriate, what does that mean? That means is that if we're going to grow food, we have to make sure that the food corresponds to the people's needs and culture and traditions in their neighborhoods. Saving seeds 
very important. There are maybe two companies that are saving seeds that are patents or patenting seeds. I mean, right now you, you should be so upset because in essence, who are we? We're seeds with DNA. And we've allowed certain companies to patent seeds, to own seeds. Well, there's a lot of us, there's this underground movement in defiance that are now saving their own seeds. Every second we are losing seeds as we go through climate change. And so it's important for those who have been left behind in this movement to understand the importance of not only owning land, but saving seeds and are doing that in defiance. <laughs> Growing herbs for medicine. You know, I used to be a physical therapist. And so I could see the dominance that the pharmaceutical companies were having on my patients. Right now, in my neighborhood, every other block is a fast food restaurant. At one time, it was a bar and a liquor store. But now, every other block is a drugstore. Think about it. Every other block in low-income neighborhoods is a drugstore. Why? Big business. Big business if you're poor and you're sick. Just think about it. And so what people are understanding is going back to tradition and using herbs as medicine. Forming cooperatives. If you think people are waiting for the federal government to fix the food system, they're not. They're taking back their, their own system and forming cooperatives. Forming food movements, alliances conferences, own workshops that that's geared to, to their needs as farmers and as individual people. Rewriting history, we talked about that. Rewriting history in our books. No, Christopher Columbus didn't find America. America was already here. Understanding the stories of indigenous people. And for you, your hard assignments, is that if you were lucky, or still lucky, to have grandparents and great-grandparents who were once farmers, take out those iPhones, those Samsung Galaxies, and videotape their conversation, videotape their history. Because if you don't, 10 years from now, they'll tell you that their family were never farmers. That, that whole tradition will be lost. Capture it. Storytelling is so important. Storytelling talks about your family, your tradition. And if we're going to move this food movement in a way that's diverse and inclusive, then we need stories. Forming farmers market. I started a farmers market 15 years ago in a low income neighborhood because I was told that it wouldn't work. No one's going to come to the Bronx because number one, it's too far for farmers to come. Number two, poor people can't afford it. And number three, the Bronx is dangerous. So let's take number three. The Bronx is dangerous. Why like so many neighborhoods in New York City is being gentrified. Number two, Poor people can't afford. Well, poor people together per capita spend more money on food than any other group. And the first one, it's too far. Well, if you look at a map, in order to come from down upstate New York to go down to 14th Street, you got to go through the Bronx, you got to go through Harlem, and you got to go down to 14th Street. And so, again, when obstacles are placed before us, it's people who are galvanizing their community and starting their own farmers markets, their own CSAs, their own food boxes, and not waiting for the government to do or mobile markets. 
supporting small farmers. Folks, I, I said, like I said in the very beginning, the average age of a farmer is 58 years of age. If we don't get to young people understanding the importance of farming, then we just give it up to the big companies and let them handle it. So some of you think about farming. Think about it. Didn't happen to me until I was 31 years of age when I first got into my community garden. And then when I was 60, was able to work with my friends to get three acres. So it's never too late to think about farming. And having conferences and workshops that reflect by the diversity of communities. And I say that because time and time again, I've gone to communities, I'm sorry, gone to conferences, gone to workshops where the intention is about food and food justice and about diversity. And I walk into that room of 1,500 people, and the first thing I do is count on my hand how many people look like me. And time and time again, I've gone to conferences well intended, and five of us out of maybe 1,500, five of us are people of color in conferences that talk about food justice and sovereignty and diversity. But again, I tell you, when you see injustice, you have to call it out. And these are some of uh, my friends that are doing work in Detroit, in Oakland, in Philly, that they're taking back their communities. And they're doing markets and urban farming and taking over land. So, if y'all thought I was going to just stand here and talk all day, y'all got action steps. <laughs> Write them down, take a picture. First action step, power masking. The only reason why I'm here is because Pete asked me to come. How many times have you sat in a room, a conference, and you said to yourself, hmm, someone needs to be here. It's lacking. And again, getting out of your comfort zone. And it's not Outreach, outreach is not engagement. It's getting the courage to invite people to come. To invite people that need to be here, need to be at a workshop or a conference, invite them to come. And the only reason why I'm here is because Pete asked me to come. Again, share your stories. Those phones, take them out. Capture the stories. And once you capture those stories, share those stories with others. Make them understand where you're coming from. And at the end of the day, you'll find how we are all interconnected. But we don't know that unless we share our stories. Break bread and share a meal. And I say that because so many times people come up to me and say, you know, I want to start a community garden. I got resources. I want to start a community garden. You know, I've got the plants, everything works out. But yet, they don't come. I don't know how to invite them. So I say to people, again, with good intentions, they have money, and they start gardening. I say to them, did you ever ask the people if they wanted it? A lot of times things fail with all good intention is because your heart is there in trying to do something good, but you never ask the community if they want it. So gardens fails, project fails, because with good intention, you've never asked the community if that's what they want. You've never asked about their concerns. You never asked as if it's a partnership between what you're trying to do and what the community is doing. And I've seen time and time again, community gardens fail, farmers markets fail, 
CSI, CSA, or Martin's fail is because there's no buy-in from the community. It's your project, it's your idea, but it doesn't come from the community. And in essence, it's fair. it fails. Also, folks, you gotta make yourself feel uncomfortable to be comfortable. And the only way you can do that is inviting people. And the best way you can do that is having a meal. Sitting down, everybody wants to come when it has food, free food, everyone wants to come, free food, people will show up. But sit down and have a meal to break bread. <coughs> And if you're interested in getting outsiders to come at a table where the table is diverse of different types of groups based on ethnicity, based on race, based on religion, think about the location. How are they going to get there? Do you have a location that they need to drive and they don't have a car? What time is your meal? your program, your workshop. Because time and time again, if your workshop is 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, who's showing up? People at work. Use these nonprofits. But if you want to get the community, you got to have it at 6 or 7 o'clock so that people in the community can attend your workshop or your meal. Next, child care. Some people don't think about that. There are people that work they have children. So if you want to get the community involved in your project, child care. Think about child care. Last, think about translation. Does everything have to be in English? There are a lot of people who work in the fields that speak a, a, a different language. And if, we're able, if, we, if we want to communicate and see that we have a system that is diverse, you got to think about communication and translation. Share resources. Important. Those are my three principles, y'all. Opportunity. Capital. Land. Or business. You give poor people, poor folks, the capital, resources, land, opportunity, and they can move mountains. But again, it's finding that power dynamics of those that have and those that don't want to give up that power or share that power. But just think about it. Every night I go to, I go to sleep, I think about how my community would change if resources were put into that community, resources and money and job creation just think about how that would change the dynamics of hunger and poverty if people had the ability to have a living wage job where they can feed their families, they can pay for institution of education, they can go to whole paycheck and buy food. But just sort of think about it. Think about what I think about each and every day the infusion of financial literacy, the infusion of, of, of income, the infusion of having people be entrepreneurs, how that would change the dynamic of, of poor communities in this country. And last, youth development. What is happening the last couple of days with the youth of this country stepping up their voices against gun control, gun control is monumental. And we in the food movement need to do the same thing. We need to stand up for justice so that no one, no one is left in hunger or in poverty. So I'll leave you all with this. It's up to the thing about. It's just a quote I always use. To grow your own food gives you power. You know who and why you grew it. You grew it for yourself, your family, and your communities. 
Today, I come here not to just to talk, but to, to give you some insight on what is happening out there, to make you realize the power that you have as youth in this nation, but the power that you have in your voice, in your individual power to stand up and shout out injustice when you see it, instead of being passive and allowing things to happen. I say two things that kill a movement is silence and complacency. And so I hope today I opened your eyes. I want you to think. I want you to turn the lens of people who have been deemed powerless and turn that lens into people who are just trying to do something to make their lives a little better. Thank you so much. Here, here we have about five minutes for questions. Oh, questions. The questions because I'm coming back next year. Because when I said, who knows about food and social justice, I want every hand to be raised up. You know, different. Okay, talk to me. Yes. Speaking on youth leadership, um, at least three states now have started to push back against healthy food in schools, saying that their experience is the kids simply won't eat it, that it just goes wasted. Can you talk about? Urban farming, and you've worked with young people, your experience as it changes diets. Right. You know what? There are a lot of kids that come, that come from different cultures and backgrounds. And they don't eat sometimes the American folk food. And what the problem is that they're not eating food that they're not used to at home. And so a lot of it is on the school system, a lot of it is on parents, a lot of it is on us, changing the dynamics of the school food system. When I grew up, we had kitchens, and so parents had input in what the, the cafeteria was able to, to produce. Nowadays, most of the food comes from a few companies, and it comes frozen, prepackaged, and it's heated in a microwave and give it to kids and they expect to eat it without no nutritional value, without thinking about their ethnicity or their culture. And so when kids see that, we wouldn't eat that food, they throw it away. And so there needs to be a conversation with, with parents and with administration about administrators about the food system. But you know what? Again, with this new food movement that's coming, that's coming, you know, to a fruition with um, the youth, I think that will change. And I think also with community gardens, there are now schools that have school gardens. And so with the school gardens, what they're doing now is taking what they're growing in schools and using that as part of a supplement during their lunch. Good question. Next, yes. Sort of building on that, what do you think the role of local government can be or should be <laughs> in the All right, so I'm going to ask you all a question. I'm from New York City. I don't know how it is out here. But how many people know the elected officials? Everyone I know, my, I know my community board, council person, assembly person, state senator, congressman, mayor, and governor. If you don't know these people, you voted. You vote them in. They're supposed to work for you. So if you don't know them and they don't know who you are, how are you supposed to get things done? And again, we have left, we have put in it into the hands, our food system, into the hands of politicians and lobbyists. We have no connection to our food. We just sit back and say, you know what? Let them take, let the local government take care. Let the federal government take care. And the thing about it is that who are we? Are we the government? How much power do we have? So if you don't know your local elected official, then how are things supposed to change? Because again, that mindset is that someone else will do it. Good question. So, I'll work assignment again. Know your elected official. Have them come and see your project. Every elected official that I know has been to my garden, seen it, invite them, so that when it comes to eventually 
when it comes to the point where it's development or the green space, whose gardens and whose green spaces are going to be in jeopardy? Those that don't know or don't, those that don't have the backing of their uh, political parties. Something to think about. Good question. Next. Sure. I'll ask a final question. I think that's much we have time for. Oh, yeah. That's which right. is, um, you could have just, you had this interest, you wanted to farm, you could have just made that a private interest of yours. You could have just said, I'm going to go work on a farm or I'm going to go start my own. But you decided to open it up and make it a public cause as well. And I think there's a lot of people who have interests here who are on the, the, the crest of maybe, okay, should I just have this be an interest or should I go make this? Take my interest, follow my heart, and make it a public thing. What went through your head when you went when you made that decision? Dreaming big, <laughs> dreaming big. So many of us dream big. Woulda, coulda, shoulda means nothing. Dreaming big, and the only way your dream comes true is that you put it out into the open and let people hear. What are your thoughts and intentions are? The only reason why we have three acres up in Chester, New York, which is an hour and 15 minutes from New York City in a black dirt region of huge organic soil that people would pay thousands and thousands of dollars for is because I was able to shout it out to people. I'm looking for land. I'm looking for land. I'm looking for, they were tired of me saying, I'm looking for land. Because I'm seeing young whippersnappers, they getting land, and I'm not getting no land. And so I kept putting it out there. And finally, someone heard me and said, you know what? I got the place, and I got the person to talk to. Now, I got that number, right? There's always the little devil and the angel on your shoulder. So the one, you know, the negative person is going to say, Karen, don't call. Wasting your time. It's always going to end up to something, you know, negative. It's not going to happen. And then there's the other side saying, Karen, what do you have to lose? Call. If he says no, fine. And sometimes we're in that position where we're so afraid of failure being rejected that we don't take that leap of faith. I took it. <laughs> I took it. So dream big. You have ideas, dream big, and never think that you can do this by yourself. There are a lot of people who want to do the same thing that you want to do. Dream big. Shout out to the universe. And you got three minutes. <laughs> Thank, you so Thank you. Thank you for dreaming big. Karen Washington, let's hear it for us. Thank you.